we had, we had some agencies that were looking for a COO and uh, we paired Carolyn with a recruiter because the recruiter needed help screening the COO specifically for agencies. And so Carolyn's done some consulting work there and continues to do that. And so when we started talking about the need for agencies to understand what a COO does and sort of the right time to add that role into the shop, uh, it made perfect sense to ask her to do that. And then there was a lot of interest and demand around putting together a peer group specifically for COOs because in most agencies, they are the only person in the shop that understands the role and understands what they're doing. And they don't really have a lot of opportunity to talk to other people who do what they do, unlike account service people or creative people. Uh, so we decided to launch the virtual peer group, which as you guys know, uh, will start in November. Uh, and so Carolyn was the logical person to facilitate that group. And so uh, if you are interested in that group, either now or after the webinar or whenever, you need to shoot me an email. We only have room to take to start two cohorts, and each cohort will have 10 agencies in it. So um, the first one's already almost full. So if you're interested, uh, let me know, and then we will we'll get back to you. So, all right. Uh, send me an email, uh, Melissa, if you will, uh, drew at agencymanagementinstitute.com. So I can, we can chat back and forth and we can get you on the list. Okay. All right, Carolyn, I'm going to hush and let you drive the ship. All yours. All right. Thank you, Drew. Um, to see if anybody has questions. Okay. Awesome. Uh, thank you. And thank you for being here. Um, so obviously today we're talking about um, what an agency COO does and hopefully will help you identify if you need one in your shop. So of course my PowerPoint is not working. There we go. Uh, so here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the role specifically. So what does a COO do? The trigger, um, what may have changed that might mean that you need a COO now if you haven't had one previously. The impact, um, and I think this is really important for owners on how, how will hiring a COO impact your life and your day to day. Um, the skill sets, what type of person is successful in this role, and we're going to talk through a little bit of um, the, you know, the hard skill sets and the soft skills and Drew mentioned that I was paired with a recruiter, um, because there is some nuance around that role and specifically what agency operations need. So we'll talk through that. Um, the right fit, and this is that nuance, right? Operations in the service business versus say operations in man manufacturing, how that differs and just things to look out for there. Um, structure and compensation, and then next steps. How do I onboard an, uh, an operational leader um, and really how to structure that? So that's where we're headed. Um, and Drew, I'm happy to take any questions throughout. I think that's really helpful. So feel free to interrupt me. Okay. Okay, so the role, um, defining what an agency COO does. So um, at the very basic level, a COO serves as an executive leader and a business partner to the CEO, owner, president, it, it, that can come a lot of titles, but um, most often it is the owner and CEO that this person's uh, partnered with, but with a very specific focus on action. So it's all about implementing vision, really, if you boil it down. Um, what that leads to in the, in the day-to-day -day is managing the day-to-day -day operations, um, really a focus on streamlining productivity. So that's about the people, about the processes, and about the systems. Um, and we'll dig into that a little bit more. And then the implementation of strategic direction. So this is where, um, you know, oftentimes agency owners are visionary leaders. And so having somebody to come alongside them and implement their vision and create that strategic direction and measurable project progress is really important. So there's the, um, that symbiotic relationship between the two. Um, digging into the day-to-day -day operations. So I want to be um, really upfront about this. Just like everything in agencies, it really depends. It depends on your size. It depends on the services that you offer. It just depends on, you know, the skill sets of your team. Um, so there, there's a lot of um, complexity to what their role could mean, but in general, um, think about the day-to-day -day operations, what needs to function within your business for you to be successful. Um, as far as the varying skill sets, so if you think about, um, you know, if, if it's a smaller agency that has um, a primary leader that's a CEO, uh, that's going to be a different 
a scenario than a an established leadership team that has a whole array of skill sets, but may still need that operational skill set. So I think really assessing the um, the skill sets at play is important. Uh, size is also something to really look at. Um, Drew and I chatted about this on the podcast earlier, um, and we were discussing that most often it's going to be a, an agency around 25 people that really necessitates a COO. And that's based on the number of people that you have, um, most often the number of clients you have, the complexity of what your offering is. Um, but having said that, there we actually have an agency in our peer group um, who has a, an amazing COO and the owner is very progressive. And so he recognized really early on, I think when he was under 10, that he wanted a COO to really push the business forward. So um, I don't want there to be a, a misnomer that it's only if you're 25, that's not really the trigger. Um, it's really about what the vision of the, the owner and CEO is. I also um, think it depends on the sort of the owner's role and what they want them to be. So in a couple of places where Carolyn and, uh, and the recruiter, by the way, we're talking about is Art Boulay, uh, but we're also working with a guy named Jamie. Um, the, a couple places where Carolyn's helped place a CEO, COO, the agency wasn't at 25 people or they were getting close to that. But the owner was like, I, the day-to-day -day has gotten overwhelming. I can't do what I love to do, which is biz dev or creative work or whatever their vision is for their role. So uh, in the example that Carolyn's talking about the agency, I, you're right. I think he was under 10 people, but he knew he was horrible at detail and running the day-to-day -day of the business. He was not great at training his people, but he really had this great vision of what he wanted his agency to be. And he realized that he himself couldn't get them where he wanted to go. And his COO started, I think like an admin, like his VA is how she started, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then kind of grew into that role. And as he watched her take over more and more of the things that frankly he hated to do and wasn't good at, he realized that he could elevate her into that role and that it's completely changed the trajectory of their agency. So I, I would concur with what Carolyn is saying, which is while size is absolutely something to consider, it should not be the defining factor. It's really a lot of it's about the owner or owners, their skill sets and their desires of where they want to spend their time. Yeah, and I think that really the value of self awareness around that, you know, Drew, you said that both the skill sets and what the owner enjoys. You know, mm -hmm. there's going to be parts of the agency that the owner just frankly doesn't want to do, and it likely is tied to the fact that it's not their gift. But just knowing that, um, and we'll dig into that a little bit more. But I think the complexity, you know, size often um, leads to more complexity when you're growing number of people, number of service lines, number of employees. That complexity is going to grow as well. Um, so that can often create a scenario where the owner can't do it on their own. Um, so really big picture, thinking about where your agency is today and where you want to be in five years is important because just as Drew said in that example, you might not necessarily quote unquote need an, a COO today, but if you want to prepare for future growth, it might be a smart hire so that that person can grow with you and help you prepare. Um, so we talked a little bit about this, but, um, this role should be really complementary to the owner or CEO. Um, and Drew mentioned this, that it is somewhat dependent on, uh, what the, the owner's skill set or what they enjoy. So there are some owners that they want to step back from the op operations completely, but they still want to do all the biz dev, or they want to still be doing the account planning and strategy. So there is, um, going to be a, a little bit of variation on how much the COO is in the biz business versus on the business. And so that's a really um, important delineation when you're looking at structure, but it, it is highly dependent on the role of the current CEO or owner. Um, the, you know, business development is something that I think, Drew, you've always talked about that should be a primary um, role that an owner is playing, but oftentimes owners are kind of bogged down with the operational stuff. And so they're maybe not spending as much time there. So right. having that complementary role will just free up the time for more proactive business development, which then leads to more growth. And, you know, it starts that cycle. So, so hang on, Carolyn. So somebody's asking, is there a revenue size or target? Do you think if it's not size of agency, which as you know, guy is, they are going to be related, right? I mean, so again, if you're at if you're at 25 people, um, 
you know, let's let's say you're at 10 people. One thing I will say is a COO is not an entry level salary. So you have to be able to absorb the salary of this person. There's they're, they're going to be a seasoned person. I know Carolyn's going to get into that. But do you can you imagine? Well, I'm trying to think of what the agency we were talking about in your peer group. I he was under a million bucks, I bet, when he or close to a million, because he was under eight, 10 people. Yeah. When he yeah. Added her. Um so I I I would say there isn't. It's really more about where do you want to spend your payroll dollars? Carolyn, what would you say? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, because think about how different your revenue picture can look depending on your services. If you're a, a creative boutique and you're pretty much 100% hourly or management fee, whatever, and your AGI is 100% of your revenue, that, or whatever that number is, um, that's different than say, if you're a media agency who's getting 10%, so your AGI is only 10% of total revenue, right? And there's also complexities with having, um, you know, multiple service lines. So it's a bit more complicated than that. But I mean, I think the, you know, going back to the AGI metrics, Drew, and like keeping your payroll within, within those um, metrics is important, but right. it's not, I wouldn't say that there's like a specific number. There's just too many factors that go into it, I think. Yeah. So um, next question is, would you, would you see it, the COO is a full-time role, would they start out more part-time for smaller agencies? This would be hard to do as a part-time person, I would think. Yeah, um, I would tend to agree, um, unless you had the awareness and somebody that was willing to do it part-time. Um, because I will say that if you're, if you're building the role um, to prepare for growth, they're might be the ability to get the job done in a part-time situation. By the time you need a COO, I think that requires a full-time person, right? And a lot of it is being there in the day-to-day -day and helping with challenges. So that I mean, presence- a big part of that is putting out the fires and anticipating yep. problems. And I mean, I, I think you're going to want them present, whether it's physically present or virtually present, but you're going to want them on call. It is a bit of a firefighter job. I Absolutely. think so. I think it would be tough for it to be a part-time role. So yep. somebody else asked the question, which I'm going to push to the end, but I'm just, I'm gonna just going to say it so we remember. And by the way, I am sure this will be an ongoing topic in the peer group. How do you get your owner or CEO out of the day-to-day -day little things? So I'm going to put a pin in that. We'll talk about it at the end, but I'm sure that if I were going to, if I were going to guess what a common theme of the peer group would be, it would be, how do I get the owner to let go enough, even though they want the COO to do the work, letting go and wanting it to be done by someone else are sometimes two separate things. So, yeah. so I promise, Christine, we will address that, but uh, I'm just going to hold it till the end. All right, keep going, Carolyn. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so the other thing I just wanted to mention, so in terms of being in the business or on the business, so there's two options when you're bringing somebody into the COO role. Well, there are, there are more than two, but one option is that you find somebody that is already with your agency that has kind of come up through the agency that has the skill set and you develop them into an operational leader. So that could be your director of client services that then you promote to a director of operations and then a VP of operations and then COO. Um, that could be a lot of different things. But if you do that, it's highly likely that they are going to be more involved in the business in their COO role than if you bring somebody in from the outside. So for instance, in my scenario, I started in the business. I came up through the business and was there, I've been there for almost 19 years and have done multiple jobs. So I, in my role, I am still in the business reviewing scopes of work and working on strategy and planning and working day to day with our client services team. I would say I'm much more hands-on than I would be if I hadn't come up through that. Um, so just a difference in, in the role. And again, that goes to structure. Yeah, we had, we had another AMI agency hire a COO specifically to run the business of the business. Now they had had other agency experience and they were in a leadership role there, but they didn't grow up in their, in that specific agency like Carolyn did, but that wasn't the, that wasn't the role that they wanted this person to play. They didn't want them arms deep still in account service and other things. They wanted them really to operationalize the business completely and, and focus there and, and in the human, in the people management. So again, it depends on what your agency needs. Right. Absolutely. Structure, size. I mean, that, that all goes back to it. Um, but I would say in that case, Drew, this streamlining productivity is is exactly what that person was focused on, right? Yep. They're running business. They're not in the actual work. Um, yep. So resource management, which interestingly in this world is 
primarily human centered, right? It's your resources and your greatest asset are your people. So that is a huge part of the CEO's role is, is managing the people as a resource and as an as asset. Um, managing the tech stack, just the awareness of what are all the tools that we use? What do we need? Are they complementary? Are we duplicating? Are we paying too much? Are we, you know, is there a better system, right? So it's a lot of analysis and really finding the best business solutions to help the agency be the most efficient, um, which often leads to a gap analysis, right? This is, and this can happen if there's really rapid growth, this will often happen that um, things happen really quickly and we realize we don't have a system or a process in place to handle this. And so that's where SEO would come in and help develop that and implement. Um, process mapping, again, that's going to be a derivative of that gap analysis. So um, really keeping the business functioning um, and the, the idea that you know, in manufacturing operations is about the nuts and bolts and is the assembly line working, right? And we're not striker. We're not figuring out whether we have enough mater raw materials to build the thing. Our materials and our resources are our people. So that that's just, I can't um, re really discuss how much, how important the, the people part of this is in the role. So you guys have heard us talk about that at certain sizes, the weight of the agency you are today cannot, the sis, old systems and processes can't bear the weight of the agency you've grown into being. This is often a pressure point that triggers for agencies a desire to hire a COO. Is, and, and that breaking point is 12 or 15 people, again, at about 25 to 30, and then again at about 50. And so at those places, oftentimes we'll have an owner who realizes they're not they just are not equipped to sort of manage the growth and do their job as well, whatever that may be for them. So a lot of times those sizes are indicators of the hunger and need for a COO. Yes, absolutely. And it changes, right? Like you said, the scale, every chapter has a different need. So it's important that you have somebody that's staying on top of that. Um, strategic direction and implementation. So this is really like coming alongside the owner or CEO and, and taking the ideas or the vision and, and turning them into action. Um, there's often an ag agency financial management role, um, although I will say that there are a lot of owners that aren't ready to turn that over to their COO, and that is fine also, but regardless of whether they're going to run financials, almost every decision that the COO is going to make is going to have some financial impact. So it's important that that is a skill set that they have and that they feel comfortable discussing and can be strategic about the finances and really the ability to think like an owner. You want somebody that is business minded and that is going to make good decisions on your behalf for, I mean, at the end of the day, for the greatest growth and the most profit for the benefit of everyone. Carolyn, what, what level of financial visibility do you, does a CEO have to have, even if you're not going to let them see everything? I'm assuming they have to have some visibility, right? Yeah. Um, well, and I think, Drew, it depends on, you know, for instance, even the metrics. Like, I would assume that at a COO level, they're going to be seeing payroll and they're going to be seeing all client billing, no question, because they have to be able to look at utilization and are we over-servicing or under-servicing? Are our scopes accurate? Like, client billing to me is a no brainer. They, they should be able to see everything about profitability there. Um, and then the, the hourly, you know, depending on how you bill, if you're working off of actually billing hourly, then that, and that's tied to salaries, which I would imagine most agencies are not, but if they are, then, then salaries are going to be more important. Um, but again, I think there's the, the question of accountability, who's responsible, you know, for the keeping everything within the metrics, if right. that is the COO, then they need to have all the information in order to make good decisions. Um, the business planning. So, um, you know, I think as an owner and a COO, and, and again, I'm, I'm thinking of the kind of typical CEO entrepreneur that starts an agency or that runs an agency that is um, highly visionary. So, Oftentimes that person, and especially in the agency business, there's going to likely be a, a very creative mindset. Um, sometimes that's coupled with a, a, a stellar operational mindset as well, but sometimes not. So having somebody to come in and look at, you know, what are the ideas and then distilling them down is really important. Um, and putting that into, you know, there are some owners that 
they don't like to think in terms of goals and business planning because they kind of just want to see how it comes and trust the universe and, and move forward. Right. So having some sort of structure and plan for the agency to follow, and that becomes more and more important as you grow, because your team needs to know what the goals are in order to kind of follow and to make good decisions on behalf of whatever the agency's goals are. Um, more here. So operational strategy and structure, this is, um, can be so boring, right? Andrew, we've talked about, this is not the sexy side of the agency. This right. isn't the fun creative side, but, um, the operational strategy, you know, we're talking about org charts and reporting structure and, you know, all of those decisions, who reports to who, and what is the accountability structure, um, the agency approach. And I, I, I purposely left that broad because, the agency has to have a, an approach and a stance on pretty much everything. And oftentimes you won't know that you need that until somebody comes and asks you and your feet are to the fire and you have to create one, right? So there has to be somebody that can, can really take the lead on creating that. Um, policies are another area where I think COOs are going to be um, highly involved and typically the leader, because again, typically owners don't love the idea of policies. You know, they don't want to be doing the timesheets. They don't, you know, that's just not how their brains are wired. Um, so you have to have a leader that can lead by example and that can create the accountability and the structure for to hold your team accountable to that. So that's really all about setting expectations, um, creating the consistency for your team so that then you can hold them accountable because they know what the expectations are. And ultimately, the, at the end of the day, the whole goal there is to reduce risk and improve import, uh, performance. I, I will say, though, I mean, we do joke that this isn't the sexy stuff, but honestly, to a good COO, this is the sexy stuff, right? So for somebody who's operationally minded and, and systems and process minded, you know, this is one of the places where Danielle and I differ in our business is she's much more about system and process and rules. And I'm like, I don't really like any of that. So again, we we model very much like a, two business owners that bring different skills, just like you and and your partner do, Carolyn. I mean, he's much more visionary, and yeah. you know, you're much more like nuts and bolts. Let's get it done. Let's get it done on time. Let's make money. And I, I think all of you can see the value of having both of those mindsets inside the same business at a C level, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that the complementary skill sets are really important. Um, so this is the human side, right? So human resources. Um, in our agency, we actually have, so partly because of my role still being in the business, but also just partly because of the need, um, we have a director of operations who, func she manages really all the human resources. So employee benefits, uh, recruitment, retention. She's managing the whole process of onboarding and offboarding, all of those things. And if you're, if you are growing really rapidly, that's probably something you're aware takes a lot of time. So if there isn't somebody in an operational role that's managing that on behalf of the owner, um, I, that's definitely another trigger, right? That, that rapid growth. Performance management, again, this goes back to setting expectations and then the ability to, to hold the team accountable to those expectations. And the COO often will um, directly manage the leadership team. So what that does is it creates, um, takes another thing off of the plate of the owner um, of not having direct report, reports, um, which again, that's a personal decision often on whether they want to be the you know direct manager, but I'm seeing more and more that that owners are ready to take a step back. And it's a lot to manage the leadership team. Like it's often, it's time consuming and um, sometimes having that buffer in between can be really helpful. Culture too. Um, while, you know, culture is more than just one person, a COO can often be the one that's kind of leading that charge and making sure that the, you know, the day-to-day -day does reinforce what the culture is. So identifying, you know, it does the way we make decisions on a daily basis support how we've identified our core values and really making, making sure that alignment is there from a cultural perspective. Okay, the trigger, how do I know if I need a CEO? So um, at the very basic level, again, uh, if the team has great ideas, including you as the owner, um, if you have great ideas, but have trouble implementing them, um, that might be a time for a, a need for an operational leader. Um, I thought for, for those of you that are in a, a live peer group, even being in, you know, 
couple days in meetings, you come out of that with a list of notes or ideas that are in your head that you haven't even written down. And the idea of going back and doing all the research and implementing all those new ideas can be kind of daunting. So an, somebody in operations, though, will take that list, go back and do the research, create a plan, go through what makes sense for your agency and what doesn't, and then come back with a proposal of here's what I think we should do. So if you look at that as a resource and and really the ability to to lean on that, although, Drew, I know that, you know, Live groups are for owners and not all COOs are going to be owners, but in any conference or in any scenario, having somebody to implement is really important. Um, the life cycle of the business. Um, again, you know, the, the question earlier on that about where's your agency today and where do you want to be in five years? I think that's really important to take a look at. Um, but also, you know, where are you at? Are you just starting out? Have you hit that? 15 mark or 25 mark where you need to scale your process or systems. Um, what's happening in the agency? Did you get a huge client and you don't have the systems in place to manage that client? Um, have you had really rapid growth or did you add a department that may be adding complexity? There's a lot of things that could be the trigger. Um, and again, kind of depends on where you're at with your own agency, but adding additional people or service lines can often be one of those triggers. Um, in, in general, though, the idea of growth, whether it is, you know, clients, revenue, whatever it is, services, that means that you have to make more decisions as the leader. And that is really challenging. Decision fatigue, I think, is something that leaders are going to struggle with oftentimes. And having somebody to share that burden is, is really important. Um, scaling in general, regardless of where it's happening in the business, but that's going to create complexity and more complexity is often a need for a greater need for operations. Yeah. So David makes the point. He says, here's, here was his when, if your CEO, me is ready to quit the business after 20 years, because they're overwhelmed with agency work in addition to operational duties and which meant he did, he struggled to do both of them. Well, yeah, I think David, that's often the sign is like, I just can't do all of this anymore. I can't bear the weight of this, but I do think one of the underemphasized parts of having a great COO is having that thinking partner and having somebody to sort of talk through the decisions because as the agency gets big, bigger and more complicated, and honestly, with COVID and virtual work and all the other things that we're dealing with today, forget size, it's just more complicated. So it's, it is nice to have someone else who is more operationally minded and system and process minded to talk through what's going on in the agency and really help you come to better decisions than you might have done by yourself. Absolutely. All right. So um, areas to assess if you're, you know, still thinking about this of do I have, let's say I'm, I'm feeling some of that tension or some of that pressure um, looking at what the structure of the agency is currently and really assessing your own skill sets and where you want to be and also the leadership team skill sets. So I think, you know, Drew, Drew, you say all the time, what got you here may not be enough to get you to the next level. Right. And that's really what this is about. You know, somebody can run an, an agency for 20 years, and then at some point it becomes too much for whatever reason. Uh, and that's okay. And sometimes it's just a matter of that you know, individual is ready to take a step back because they've been doing it for a long time and it's, it's heavy. Right. Um, so really looking at like the structure of the agency too can help make that decision on do we have the people here and do we need to restructure or do we need to add the role? Um, the impact, and you just mentioned this, um, but those complementary styles, the visionary and operator together, um, really that the differing perspectives leads to a stronger approach because you're going to have a lot of dialogue and there's going to be, you know, discussion about the potential pitfalls of an idea um, you know, just kind of the checks and balances to a certain extent, um, but also just the decision making support that not every single decision has to be made by one person. And I, I think that I, I couldn't stress that enough that the number of decisions that agency owners have to make every single day can be a huge burden. So support. I, I also think one of the yin and yangs that happens with a owner, CEO and a COO is as a visionary, um, and I will speak for myself, we tend to go, we should do this. I'm going to do it today. 
right? And and we're like onto it right away. And I think one of the values of a COO or someone who is minded that way is that they slow the visionary down to sort of look at, okay, you're about to leap. Not only is there not a not a, not only is there not water in that pool underneath you, but that's not that's not a pool. That's a cavern, and you're going to drop fifty feet and sort of slow you down and help you think about some of those things. So I think that's probably one of the, also one of the things that a CEO, CEO, owner, visionary has to learn is how to take into account the breaks that sometimes the COO puts on for very good reasons, because we're not used to having them when we've been making decisions by ourselves, which I believe some of us would agree sometimes has gotten us into trouble. Yeah. And the breaks, I mean, I, this goes back to that question that you put a pin in, right? How do you, if your owner says they want to be out of the day and day, but they, they can't quite get out, sometimes it's just because they don't like the breaks, right? Like right. they don't want risk management being the leader. It, you know, they want the, the big ideas and the visionary mindset to be driving the agency. Uh, and there's great value in that, but there's also great value in risk management because it can save some heartache. Yeah. Uh, and the idea that, you know, the thing that I've learned, honestly, the hard way for every action, there is a reaction and it's typically something that we don't anticipate, right? So we think we have this great idea and it might be just on the staff level that we're going to implement something new and then something else happens that we did not anticipate. So having somebody with that more operational mindset, hopefully can, can kind of head some of those off and, and save some pain. Yep. Um, so the other thing, and I, I've said this a couple of times, but as the owner, what do you want your next chapter to look like? Do you, are you ready to get out of the weeds? Are you ready to take a, a step back? And Drew, you mentioned this, you know, you know, for the one in our, our peer group that early on decided to have that operational support, he had no intention of getting out of the business. It's just that he wanted to be stronger. And so that was, you know, a really aspirational move, um, and smart move on his behalf. But other other owners that are are you know based on where they're at in their own life or how the industry has changed you know there's there's some people that don't love the new the the way the industry industry has morphed and that's okay too but just really being honest with yourself about what you want this role to do if you need it first and then how you want them to support you because that will be important to identify for success for both parties. And, and and the other thing too is it may be that you can't get to your job. So we had an agency owner that now has a COO and he was a he's a brilliant salesperson and he really wanted to grow the business, but he couldn't get out of his own way to sell enough to have enough time to focus on biz dev because he was quagmired in the operational stuff. On the flip side, we have an agency owner whose agency has grown exponentially in the last two or three years. And for her, it was really about this thing has gotten bigger than any business I've ever worked in before. And I need help running this bigger organization. And when I say big, there are 25 or 30 people, but it was just more than what she had experienced in her own professional life. And she was smart enough to go, you know what, I, I can do this, but I'm probably not the best person to do this. So we have the bandwidth, we have the, we have the salary, we have the room to bring someone in to really operationalize the work. And in their case, they, they were really struggling with just how to get work to flow through the business. It was, they were starting to drop balls and things like that. And so she really needed somebody who was super process oriented. And, and that was what she went out and found. Yeah. And all and so, those, all those questions about, you know, where do you want to be in the business? And what are your gifts? What do you want to lean into? Like oftentimes the the things that take us the most time are also the things that we either don't enjoy or we're not the best at. And a lot of times those are all tied together, right? Um, so if you're drowning in the tasks that are difficult and you don't enjoy, that might be a good trigger. And also think about the amazing relief that that could offer. If you didn't have to deal with those things that are bogging you down and, that, and there's somebody that actually in, enjoys working working on that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that self-reflection and that self-awareness, I think is important. Um, but the ability for, for you as an owner to focus on the things that you enjoy most and that will drive the business forward. You know, a lot of times that is biz dev. So. Um, okay. So more about just how, how it's going to impact. Um, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, but turning ideas into action, 
um, you know, integrating the vision, implementation, they're all the same thing, right? It's taking the idea, running it through a filter, you know, looking at what the risks and rewards are, um, but really the, you know, assessing, engineering a plan, putting together how, what the approach is gonna be and how that's going to actually work. Um, most often visionary leaders aren't, that's not their best skill set, right? They're, they are big picture and they can come up with a, a wonderful plan. And then they need somebody to help engineer or an idea. They need somebody to help engineer the plan to get them there. Um, so that's really a, a huge role of the COO. Um, and then implementation across the team, if it's an internal initiative, whatever that may be. And then evaluation. Um, the constant evaluation of what is working and what is not working is another thing that's going to fall on the COO. And I think agencies do a really good job of this, partially just because we're in an industry that changes so rapidly, continually, um, that you know we're looking at, at things. And I, I always say we're in an iterative business. It's never like a we've defined this approach and we're going to set it and forget it because things are going to change next week or a client's going to cut budget or a client's going to add budget or there's going to be a new service or AI is going to come and it's going to throw us all into, into a tizzy of figuring out how to handle it. So again, that evaluation is really important too, just to, to make sure that we're um, attending to the changes in the business. Okay. Skill sets. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these because I think they're they're somewhat self-explanatory. What you would expect as a as an executive leader, strategic planning, financials. We've talked through all of this, um, but the the combination of hard skills and soft skills is really important. Um, I'm going to skip to this next slide um, because I think these are the areas that that I really focus on when I support agencies who are recruiting. Um, the idea of being curious and investigative. So. Digging into the idea, um, digging into you know the issues that are at the core of whatever problem has been identified, and really that investigative approach is really important. Um, the you know for those of you that are familiar with the Colby, I would I would imagine most COOs are going to be high fact finders. They're going to ask a lot of questions and they're going to dig into all those details. Um, solution focused, which by nature means that they're also also identifying problems, but they aren't focusing on the problem, they're identifying it and then focusing on the solution, which is again, really that focus on the follow through and implementing versus kind of getting stuck in that problem identification phase. Um, detail oriented, they're crossing the T's and dotting the I's that sometimes will fall through the cracks. So that's, you know, baseline, you would expect that, but really, really important. Um, committed to action. so. Again, uh, talking about the Colby test, you know, the follow through is really important, but they're going to be, um, you're going to take in information and they're going to put together a plan and move on it. Um, we don't want another senior leader to be, you know, not in a place of taking action. We want this to be, again, complementary to the idea and really moving it forward on behalf of the agency. Um, and then com comfortable with conflict. Again, this goes back to the, the HR component and that we are managing people with emotions. Um, but you, as, an, as a COO, you're often going to be dealing with conflict. And so you, you can't shy away from that. So the idea of addressing those problems and again, being solution focused, um, but not, you know, Drew, you made a joke on the podcast that I'm not conflict at first, which I I'm going to put it out on the table and I'm going to deal with it. You are not. Nope. It's a quality. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it goes back to the relationship too, right? That as the CEO and the COO have to have a great level of trust in order to put all those, you know, concerns on the table and, and deal with them. Um, experience and background. So this isn't a, you know, by no means is this a have to, but just from what I've seen, experience that is helpful for people who have kind of come up through the agency often project management, because that's that operational mindset of, you know, schedules and process and systems, um, and then also client services. Um, I would say for a, an executive role, the, the C-suite role of a CEO, that client services can often be a better fit for that because they know how to manage the people side and the business side. Um, they're also exposed to budgets and, you know, resource management and some of those other things. So uh, sometimes, a you know, a strong director of client services is a good person to look at to, for consideration on whether it's somebody you can develop into that operational leader. 
um, the right fit. So again, you know, it's one thing for a person to have all the skill sets, but they also have to fit in your agency culture. So that's really where I come in when I'm supporting recruitment um, is I do a pretty deep discovery with the leadership team to get a sense of what the agency feel is and, you know, what their pain points are and the things that they talk about and that are important to them so that I can test those against, you know, those that have the, the skill sets and make sure that it's the right fit. And there have been multiple people that have, you know, on paper, they're great and, and they may be great in a different agency, but in the one that we're recruiting for, like the fit just isn't right. Um, but in general, the, you know, the person, that natural team leader, if you think about group projects, who's the person that steps up and takes the lead, that wrangles the project. Um, and again, the person that takes the idea, makes plan and makes it happen. Um, the kicker. So this, and I get into a little bit the, the different levels, but um, leadership. So if you're going to have a C, specifically, if you're going to have a C-suite level, a COO versus like a director of operations, it has to be the kind of person that others want to follow. So leadership by example is going to be really important, but also just that EQ um, and, and the ability to, to have the human connection and to manage from that um, space. Collaborative too, you know, the, the whole idea that competition happens at the bottom and collaboration happens at the top. I think that's really important for this role, um, not only with the CEO and the COO, um, that, that has to be a collaborative relationship, but even, even still with the leadership team that it, it is never gonna be beneficial if it's adversarial. So that balance and, and uh, collaboration and trust is really important. And I, th I think the emotional intelligence is really critical. I mean, I think that a lot of the CEO's job is to get people to do stuff they don't wanna do or in a way they don't wanna do it. And so being able to really connect with people and help them understand why it's important. Oh, here you go. It's like, I saw your slide. Yeah. Um, I just think it's critical. So. Yes, you need to be somebody who's not conflict adverse, but they need to approach conflict in a way that the resolution is the person wants to do what you need them to do in that role. Even if originally they walked in going, I'm never going to do timesheets or a process that way or what, whatever it may be. Yeah. And some of that is just, you know, about understanding the different, you know, different needs, right? So if you're a, a full service agency that has developers and media buyers and creatives, you probably know that you need to manage those people differently because they think differently and they're motivated differently. And so it's not a one size fit all approach. So that EQ really comes into to play when you're dealing with the specific scenarios and understanding what they need to hear in order for them to process the why behind the decision. Because the, your why as an operator or your why as a, an owner visionary may be completely different than some of the staff. So I, just that flexibility and, and the, the willingness and patience to take the time and listen, that there's a lot of people management in this role. And so that, that has to be somebody that, that can build the relationships and build the trust, not only with the leadership team, but with the entire staff so that they want to follow. Um, structure and compensation. So I mentioned this, and I again, it goes back to the the size of your agency and the skill sets at play. Whether you have a an established leader leadership team, um, whether you're you know what your skill sets are as an owner, but there could be anything from a director of operations to a VP of operations to a chief operating officer. Um, and sometimes it makes sense, again, depending on the life cycle of the business. Sometimes it makes sense to bring somebody in as a director of operations and assimilate them into your culture and then develop them into a COO. Because naturally from a cultural perspective, they're going to be received better. So again, this is gonna be highly dependent on where your business is at and what the culture is like. Um, you know, There are some agencies where it's a better decision to bring in a COO straight from the get-go and just kind of plant the flag and say, this is the direction we're going. Um, but there needs to be some discussion around that to, to make sure that you're approaching it in the best way. Compensation. So I looked at the 2023 AMI study just to see where these were at based on my experience in the market. Um, and again, this is going to really vary between the director level up to the COO um, level, but the AMI study has the ranges at 110 to 160. What I'm seeing um, in my um, consulting is more of the 180 to 220. So, and you mentioned this earlier, Drew, that this is not a low level hire. No. So you have to have the AGI and you have to have the revenue to support it. Um, you know, the need is one thing, but the, the revenue is yeah, has to be there in order for it to be successful. 
Okay, so what next? So the first thing is assessing the needs and goals. What are your goals as the owner? What are the operational gaps? Um, what are the cultural considerations? And what I mean by cultural considerations is, you know, how is the team working together now? What's happening with the leadership team? Just the general sense of like, what's happening in the agency, that nuance and that EQ level. Um, if you decide that you want to put somebody in place, identifying a recruitment strategy is going to be really important. So this is everything from the job description, um, you know, title, what are you going to call them to the structure? Who are they going to report to? Who is going to report to them? And really thinking through that process. And again, for every action, there's a reaction. So kind of doing some scenario planning of how could this look differently if we structured it differently? Um, and then consider a recruiter. Uh, Drew mentioned um, Art Boulay, and then Jamie at Stellar is another one that has been successful in placing. Um, but I think that if you're not going to bring somebody up from within, it's not like there's a bunch of COOs, agency COOs sitting around, right, yeah. that are going to see your ad and apply on their own. So it probably will require that you have a recruiter that's that is proactively searching on your behalf. Um, but I do think it's good to first assess whether there's the opportunity to look at somebody internally and, and uh, develop them because, because they already know your culture. And most oftentimes, if it's a person that you respect and the team respects, that's going to be a, a, a natural transition. So there's a, a lot of great opportunity there. And with coaching and development, that's been very successful for a lot of agencies. Um, and then an implementation plan. So again, this is where I support agencies on what does it look like, right? Okay, we have this idea of we want to bring in a CEO and this is what we want to call them and how we want to structure it and how the org chart is going to look. Now what? So thinking about the timing, thinking about what the expectations are, both, both for this role, for you as the owner, and for the leadership team specifically, if you have one in place that is going to report to them, like what are the impacts that are gonna that happen there and what is the communication that needs to happen ahead of time so that you have everybody on board going in. So I, there is a need for a communication strategy, you know, internal more often than external, I would say, on again, making sure that everybody under, understands the why behind the decision and creating a culture where they see the, the value in it as much as you do. The last thing you want is for your team to, to feel threatened by this position. So that communication and understanding is really, really important. So a couple of people are asking for the recruiter's names. If you send me an email, uh, I will, I'll send you their names and connection information so you can get it. Uh, but it's Art Boulay and I can't even remember Jamie's last name now. Uh, Jamie Milliken at okay. Stellar Recruiting. But I'm happy to introduce you to both or at least give you their contact information. They do a lot of work with AMI agencies. Uh, question is, uh, what if the CEO doesn't have time to develop them, to groom them? I think coaching is a good opportunity. I mean, th there's going to have to be some level of commitment. Okay, so let's back this up. If the CEO doesn't have time, then that's a definite trigger that there's a need in some right. way or another. But if you're going to bring on a COO, you also have to, to dedicate the time to partner with them. So that could look like one meeting a week, but you are you can't just bring them on and, and set them loose. They're going to need to be assimilated into the culture. You're going to have to do the knowledge share of you know transferring everything that's in your head over to them because they can't implement if they don't know what's in your head. Um, but outside of that, there's great coaching, you know, for specifically for COOs, but also for just executive leadership. Um, and then the peer group is another great opportunity. I think that that is gonna be huge for, especially for um, new COOs to come in and, and share challenges and really collaborate on what the needs are. Yeah, for sure. All right, questions. You can probably stop sharing, Carolyn, so they can just see you. Okay, I will do that. Oh, we talked about this. You'll talk oh, yeah. about that. So I, I'll, I'll give you, uh, you guys will have the deck um, when when I send out the recording. So just so everybody knows, the we're going to start the peer groups in November. They're 90 minutes, once a month. Um, and then, like I said, we have room to start two in 23. And then we'll, we'll probably get through the first quarter of 24 before we even think about starting a third one. So if you have interest... Uh, getting to me sooner rather than later was is probably a good plan. So, um, uh, do you guys use EOS? You don't, do you, Carolyn? We don't. No, but by nature, I think similar. that way. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. I mean, 
Carol, we facilitate traction for agencies and um, Carolyn thinks like an integrator. Absolutely. I mean, she, that's, that's her whole mindset. So, yep. Uh, yeah. I, <clears throat> if you want to know about coaching, Carolyn does some, we do some, so happy to help you with, with that as well. So sorry, I'm watching the questions. Yeah, no, good. you're good. Other questions? Melissa, you said you're an eight. Are you a, um, a visionary or an integrator? Oh, I'm app. absolutely, absolutely an integrator. I'm eight, seven, four, two. I don't even remember the other number. It's so low. Okay. Yeah. And I'm an eight, eight, two, two. So fact finder. Um, you're fact talking finder. Enneagram folks, if you're not recognizing the numbers. Uh, well, actually. Um, this is Colby. Colby. Oh, so Colby. that's the new okay. Colby thing. Yeah. But ironically, Colby. often, I and here's another one, Enneagram eights are often very good operators as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about if the CEO, CEO doesn't want to let go, right? So yeah, I think a VP of ops that they don't have to be specific. So for the peer groups, someone said, is it good for a VP of ops or director of ops? Yes. It's one of those ops titles, right? Director of ops, VP of ops, COO, someone who is evolving into a COO role or whose responsibilities sort of fluctuate in that range, but maybe they don't have the title yet. So what are we doing with CEOs who don't want to let go? They know they need that the talent, but they don't want to they don't want to release control. That seems like a 12 hour conversation. It does. Yeah. Some counseling. Um, no, I think that I really identifying, trying to get to the core of the why. Um, and you know, there's there's gonna be a lot of reasons behind that, but oftentimes an owner, it's, it's their baby, right? So the idea of letting go and not having the control, even though I will say that a lot of visionaries don't consider themselves as people who want control when it's your business and your baby, you do want control because ultimately it's, it's yours. Um, so there has to be, again, that trust established really early on. Um, and then just the commitment and the reminder of why you have an operator, um, and that I would say that the coaching that Drew does and, and Danielle, sometimes that's what it comes back to is just the, you know, the reminder of why you're here and why you trusted to bring somebody in. And it, it is going to be hard. It's, it's not an easy thing to let go of that, especially if you run it kind of on your own from the get go. Um, but the, the, uh, yeah, I, David, ask them if they want their life back. Yes. Or, or, or want to save their, their marriage, he said. Or their yeah. health. Or right. there, you know, if you think about all the stress that is created for um, owners that are kind of running it on their own, it's it's huge. You know, it's stressful. So looking at it more as the relief than as you know, letting go or losing control, I think is important. So sometimes it's just about reframing and reminding. And honestly, this is where it's sometimes it's more helpful to hire somebody from within and grow them up because the trust is usually already there and it's been earned over time. But honestly, a lot of agency owners get to a point where they just can't, you know, to David's point, they just can't do it anymore. And whether they can physically do it anymore, they just can't emotionally, mentally do it anymore. And they realize that they they need the relief. But I think the other thing to do is if you're already in the organization and you're vying for that role, I think it's looking for ways to ease the burden and to be a good thought partner. And, and without necessarily having the role or the responsibility, proving yourself and showing them what it feels like to have sort of somebody else in the trenches with them when they've been sort of fighting it themselves is super helpful. Mm -hmm. Melissa, you mentioned the guardrails though, and identifying what makes them most nervous um, and how much they want to be kept in the loop. I do think it's important to, to structure the relationship between the CEO and the COO in a way that um, that meets the needs of the CEO. So like what level of detail they, do they need about what topics, how often? Um, that's That communication can really head off a lot of issues, so. Well, and I think regardless of your role in the agency, I, if you're in an agency, you know one of the most uncomfortable things is to be out of the loop and to be caught off guard either by a client or a peer or a, an employee or whatever it is. So I think one of the critical roles for a COO is helping the CEO always feel like they're in the loop 
whether they're in the day-to-day -day or not, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, drawing from account services often, a lot of times a great account person, that's the right path for them. They, they are detail-oriented. They are agency-focused. They've thought about profitability from the very beginning, all of the things you want a COO to think about. There's, their mindset is already kind of in that direction. The idea too of, um, you know, identifying somebody who can think like an owner, uh, mm -hmm. while that's hard, you're not going to be able to just ask somebody straight out and get a good answer, but you can identify based on how they make decisions. Again, having somebody that's come up through the agency, you will have the history of how they've made decisions, but, uh, you know, being business minded and making good decisions on behalf of the owner, you know, that's part of Melissa, you just said again, of the, the fear of a COO doing something that they don't approve of, you know, if they know the decision-making process and they trust that, then that's one thing. But there also has to be a lot of communication of what level of decision-making power does the COO have? That's gonna grow over time with more trust, right? Um, but also, you know, if there's, you know, again, going back to the, there's some agent, agency owners that hold on to financials um, for a while, because that's, that is the, the area where there's the most risk, right? In theory. So there's ways to- work Usually around. the last, that's the last wall to fall, right? Yes. Yes. And it may never fall. I mean, depending on how, how savvy um, the owner is from a financial perspective, that may be okay too. Right. But okay. the conversation, sorry, it goes back to, you know, the time that needs to be dedicated to communication between the two parties. That's going to be really important because a CEO, you know, shouldn't be caught off guard. They should either have the full trust. And so they've given the autonomy or there should be enough communication that there should never be something that catches them off guard. Other questions? Okay, so if you want to get connected to the recruiters, feel free to email me if you want more information about the peer groups um, or you know you want to be in the peer group, send me an email. I will uh, take this recording and Carolyn's deck and get it out sometime next week probably. Uh, so you guys will see that. Um, the link will be in the newsletter. Since you didn't sign up for this webinar, I can't email it to all of you. So the link will be in the newsletter and I'll stick it inside the podcast Facebook group if you're a part of that. Um, so know that that's it. And if you don't get it, if you don't see it either place, shoot me an email and I'm happy to share it with you. But give me till the middle of next week to get that done. So Carolyn, thank you. This has been awesome. Uh, anybody else, last questions? All right, we're going to let you go. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend.